Hello, everybody. I trust everybody is doing well. I'm right over there. How you guys doing? So, um, just want to say I miss you guys. I really, really do. My afternoon, my morning uh, is not quite the same. And I'm, yes, serious about that. Anyway, uh, hope all is well. Stay safe. Maintain social distance. Um, anyway, I thought what we would do would be review uh, the eye, review the ear. First period class, we didn't get to uh, talk about the ear, so that'll be a um, kind of a new situation for you guys and girls. I also want to dissect the eye, have that put online, and then you can uh, take a look at that, especially first period students who missed the dissection. So it'd also be good for, uh, for seventh, or uh, that is eighth period section, to uh, check it out also just as a good review. We want to uh, keep the ball rolling. Um, let's just take a look here. So notice the different parts of the eye. All right, light waves are going to travel from the outside source here. Notice they're going to encounter first the conjunctiva, which is a very thin layer of tissue. The majority of refraction, though, is going to occur here with the cornea. And then this lens is going to bend the light, and we're going to get an image produced uh, on the back here of the retina. So, quickly, what are some of the parts of the eye that we've talked about? Notice we have the uh, cornea, which is going to be important for refracting light. I do want to say this. There is not an image produced unless that light is bent. So we got to have bending of light here and bending of light here. Remember also the cornea is, it lacks blood vessels, so it is easily transplanted from one person to another. Uh, we talked about the pupil. The pupil is going to open and close, and it's going to regulate the amount of light that's passing through the uh, eye itself here. Notice the lens is going to refract light. These suspensory ligaments help hold the lens in place. This lens here has an amazing ability to change its shape. So we can actually, uh, we can actually tighten up these uh, suspensory ligaments and flatten out this lens, or we can loosen up these ligaments and they will allow the uh, light, or I'm sorry, allow the lens to get a little more, a little more oblong shape, a little more rounded shape. Now, why is this important? because uh, that allows us to accommodate vision. In other words, that allows us to uh, focus on objects that are near and then refocus on objects that are far. The lens of the projector here does not have that ability. Uh, we can focus on near and far with the lens on the projector, but it's because the lens itself uh, can be moved towards the screen or away from the screen. It's not, focusing with the projector would not involve that glass lens changing its shape. So this is really an amazing structure. It's a, it's a crystalline protein structure. And it is made from life, whereas a typical lens on a camera is man-made and polished glass. So uh, miracles of uh, life uh, never cease to amaze me here. Anyway, so the light rays are going to pass through. We're going to go through this vitreous humor here. We're going to produce an image here on the retina. That image will, in fact, be inverted. It will be upside down, which is interesting. Um, how do we see it if it's upside down? Well, the image is projected here. It's upside down, but then that light impulse is going to be translated into a nerve impulse and then carried from the optic nerve to the uh, back part of the brain, the occipital region of the brain. And your brain has the role of taking that information and then turning everything right side up. So it's pretty interesting. There's been studies where they take uh, high school 
or not high school students, college students, college freshmen like you all are going to be, and uh, they give them extra credit, and they say, hey, put on these goggles. These goggles turn everything upside down, and they're asked to walk around with these uh, goggles on with the whole world upside down. Well, the brain eventually adjusts to that and then realigns the image to where it appears that the, uh, that the world is now right side up. So, kind of interesting. Brain's a fascinating structure. We will be studying the brain later on this quarter. Hopefully, I hope, we will do this uh, with you all sitting here in front of me. Once again, I do miss you all. Anyway, uh, let's see. So we've got the retina here. That's a thin, delicate, reddish tissue. That thin, delicate, reddish tissue you will be seeing when I do the dissection, and eighth period students have already identified that tissue. The rods and the cones are present in the retina. The rods and the cones, once again, are going to take the light impulses and they're going to convert the light impulses into a nerve impulse, which again is going to be carried in this direction towards the optic nerve. Kind of interesting, as we know, we looked at the optic disc. This is a region where there's no rods or cones. Maintaining social distance, of course, uh, might be kind of cool if you uh, show that to somebody in your family. Uh, it's, it's, I've seen this, I've done this uh, many times, I've demonstrated it many times, and I still get a kick out of watching that small piece of paper disappear. So uh, again, maintain social distance and uh, show somebody in your family how to, uh, how to discover their blind spot, their optic disc. All right, we also have the sclera. When we dissect the, uh, the cow eye, we're going to see that the sclera is a silvery purple structure. And the silver is actually a reflective material, and this is beneficial for night vision. So cows, raccoons, uh, many other living creatures, owls, for example, will be able to uh, reflect light from their mirror-like sclera, and let's just say that light from stars are coming in, if it misses a rod or a cone, that light will reflect off the silvery sclera and then bounce and bounce and bounce, so there'll be several opportunities for the retina, for the rods and the cones to be stimulated so that that animal can produce an image. Of course, humans have a uh, sclera, which is more dark color, more charcoal. And this is essential for day vision. Day vision, uh, we have a situation where lots of sunlight's coming in. We don't want to reflect all of that sunlight on the inside of our eye. We want to absorb excess sunlight so as not to damage the retina. So we will... Uh, we will Take in that bright sunlight, and excess light will be absorbed by that blackish uh, or near blackish pigmented material. Now that sclera here, that sclera is a tough protective coat. The students that dissect it found this out. You really have to use some elbow grease to break through here, to uh, so we can make an incision and then actually get to the creamy nougat center, which is what we're going to do in the dissection. What is the creamy nougat center? Oh, you will see the creamy nougat center when I, uh, when I dissect. So we have these rectus muscles, rectus muscles, which are going to allow the eyes to move uh, within the eye sockets themselves. So that's a pretty good review. Let's now take a look at the ear. And bear with me a moment while we bring that up. And notice, here is the ear. Well, one thing I want to talk about here is sound waves. Sound waves are quite a bit different from 
typical waves that you would be thinking about like in chemistry and physics from electromagnetic radiation. So if you're just comparing light waves or infrared ray waves or ultraviolet or x-rays, uh, sound waves require a medium to be transmitted. So they require something between the source of the sound and the listener of the sound. What is that something? It is air. On the other hand, light waves, radio waves, etc. can propagate through space, and space is a vacuum, so there's absolutely no air present, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, one requires a medium, uh, which would be sound waves, and the other one doesn't. Now, sound waves are going to emanate from, I just want you to uh, picture or uh, visualize a guitar string that's been plucked. It's going to vibrate rapidly with a certain characteristic frequency. When it vibrates, it disrupts the air molecules, which in turn will vibrate, and those vibrations will propagate through, uh, through the room and eventually find their way uh, from the outer ear and eventually find their way to the um, middle ear and then to the inner ear where we're going to take those, uh, those vibrations and convert the vibrations into nerve impulses. And those nerve impulses will then make their way to the brain. You need to realize the brain only speaks one language. It speaks nerve impulses, also called action potentials. All the world has numerous stimuli. We have light, we have sound, we have taste, we have touch. Some of the homework dealt with uh, the sense of taste and some of the pressure and temperature receptors uh, that our skin has. Well, anyway, all of that, all of that variety of, of external stimuli, we could throw in heat and cold in there as well, all of those have to be converted by the sense organs into the common language of the nervous system. And again, the common language of the nervous system is a nerve impulse, which uh, we will be referring to as an action potential. So, and of course, the brain's going to interpret all these action potentials from the various nerves. So we do have an optic nerve we do have uh, the nerve right here. This is the vestibulocochlear nerve, which obviously is important in hearing. But there are, there are many other nerves which have all sorts of responsibilities in terms of bringing sensory information from the outside world to the brain so that we can interpret it, make a decision, and maybe respond to that information or not. So anyway, uh, here is the oracle. This is going to collect sound. And the sound wave is going to be coming in. It's going to be transmitted through this external acoustic meatus. So that's the name there, external acoustic meatus. Let me, excuse me for a moment, this looks like it is a little bit fuzzy. Let me see if I can adjust the focus. Ah, yes, the focus of the lens. Well, that didn't work. Okay, I might have to get my eyes checked. I think that's better, though. All right. So the sound waves are moving in through this uh, canal here. So the external acoustic meatus, it is going to transmit the sound waves from the outside world in here to the tympanic membrane. This tympanic membrane will uh, vibrate in relationship to the sound frequency and it will transfer that vibration to these three inner ear bones. They're the inner ear ossicles. What we have here is the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And these are tiny bones which can fit on the tip of your finger. Their role here is to uh, transfer the vibrations from the eardrum here, or the tympanic membrane, and then eventually start the vibrations of what uh, this, uh, this region here called the cochlea. There is a, a region called the oval window, 
which will be vibrated in response to the malleus and incus and stapes. Now that vibration will send a will send fluids through the cochlea. And notice cochlea literally means snail. Now through a complex series of events, special hair fibers will vibrate as a result of the fluid in this cochlea. These special hair fibers convert those vibrations of fluid into nerve impulses. Those nerve impulses are then going to be transmitted here to the vestibular cochlear nerve. And then, of course, that action potential is going to make its way to the brain. And that would, uh, that would then elicit a response possibly from the brain. Well, what else do we have here? Notice we have the semicircular canal. These semicircular canals are a series of tubes, and the tubes are orientated in the X, X, Y, and Z. Z is coming out at you in the three dimensions of space. These semicircular canals help for equilibrium. So, if this is disturbed due to disease or simply being out on the ocean and not being used to all the waves on the ocean if you're out fishing on uh, wherever, uh, let's say in, in Florida on the Atlantic Ocean, then the fluid in here is going to allow responses, it's going to detect changes in head positioning and then send information to the brain accordingly about your, uh, your head position and equilibrium or balance. Notice here we have the nasopharynx. That nasopharynx is going to attach here to the auditory tube. That auditory tube leads here into the tympanic cavity. So this tympanic cavity here will, uh, we need to have, you might ask, what's the function here? Why do we connect to uh, essentially uh, nasal cavities here? And, well, actually, maybe not nasal cavities, but in the region of the nasal cavities, this would be the back part of the throat here. Notice, why do we have this tube that's leading here to the tympanic membrane, or the tympanic cavity, I mean? Well, this is important because it helps maintain an equal pressure on the inside relative to the outside of the uh, eardrum here. We want the pressure here and the pressure here to be the same so there's no stress on the eardrum. If the pressure is too high here and too low there, the, the eardrum could be perforated or, um, or severed in some way, shape, or form. Uh, they technically would say a ruptured eardrum. So this, cat, this tube here is important because it helps maintain equal pressure uh, between both sides of the eardrum. So, you guys have homework, uh, you guys have your homework where you did these drawings and review those. You are going to be responsible in a real sort of way for, for all the information that we're going through. So don't blow it off. Study, take responsibility for your education and don't let things just back up. We will figure out a way and I, I, think, uh, I think I will definitely be seeing uh, this classroom in, uh, in a certain amount of time where, yes, you are going to have to stand and deliver. In other words, you're going to have to, have to well, let me know that you've assimilated this through testing. So we'll figure out a way uh, to test. And actually, I think you guys are going to be here. And just make it easy on yourself. Just please make it easy on yourself. All right, so take a short break. I will be back quickly. Actually, I'm not really taking a break. I am bringing up another video. Okay, I hope we can see that. I might have to check uh, the video. It might be cut off a little bit.
All right. Notice, here's the eyeball, and here's the optic nerve, and then of course the optic nerve coming from the other, from the other eye, would be the left eye there. Notice uh, these nerve fibers are going to cross, sending nerve impulses to this region of the brain and nerve impulses around, take the long way home from there to this region of the brain. Uh, that posterior region of the brain is the occipital region. So let's, um, let's take a look at the video. The special sense of vision involves structures of the eye, the optic nerve, and portions of the brain. As light enters the eye, it passes through the cornea. The cornea is a transparent connective tissue that covers the anterior one-sixth of the eye, like a contact lens. Its convex shape refracts the light through the pupil, an opening in the colored portion of the eye. Light next passes through the biconvex lens that focuses the light onto the retina. The retina lines the interior surface of the eye. It has two parts, the retinal pigment epithelium and the neural retina. The darkly pigmented retinal epithelium is adherent to the neural retina and prevents light scatter within the eye. The neural retina has multiple cell types that are arranged in three cell layers. The outer layer contains rod and cone photoreceptor cells that respond directly to light. In general, cones are used for high spatial resolution and color vision. In contrast, rods are used in poor lighting conditions and have low spatial resolution. Rods and cones both translate light energy first into a biochemical message and then into an electrical signal that is passed to cells in the inner nuclear layer. The cells of the inner nuclear layer further process the signal and then transmit it to the ganglionic layer. Axons of the retinal ganglion cells, of which there are approximately one million, course along the inner margin of the retina and converge at the back of the eye to form the optic nerve. The optic nerves attach to the ventral aspect of the brain at the optic chiasm. From here, the optic tracts extend around the brainstem to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Most ganglion cell axons from the retina end at the synapses in the lateral geniculate nucleus. Visual information leaves this area of the thalamus. In so the just get the general idea here. Uh, 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 some of these details, unless I stop and point them out, I wouldn't be uh, expecting you to be responsible for them. All right, so that's a pretty good look, so to speak. Let's take a look at hearing. And we'll also, of course, listen. RR. Sound waves strike the tympanic membrane and cause it to vibrate. Vibration of the tympanic membrane causes the three bones of the middle ear to vibrate. So this is a really good look. The other picture didn't show a good look at the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. So this is excellent. Uh, notice the relationship between the sound wave and the um, tympanic membrane. And the malleus, incus, and stapes. So these are the inner ear ossicles, they're called. of the stapes vibrates in the oval window. The vibration of the foot plate causes the paralymph in the scala vestibuli to vibrate, which in turn causes displacement of the basal or membrane. Short wavelengths from high-pitch sounds cause displacement of the basal Not responsible the for these window. terms. This movement is detected by hair cells of the spiral organ, which are not visible in the animation. Long wavelengths from low pitch sounds cause displacement of the basal or membrane far from the oval window. Again, this movement is detected by hair cells of the spiral organ, which are not visible in the animation. When the vibrations reach the paralymph in the scala tympani, they travel to the round window where they are dampened.
Okay. That looks pretty good. I am going to stop the video and that'll be the end of part one.